Hey guys, this is Paul Acevedo of Windows Central. I'm Tom Spillman of Sickhead Games. I'm a programmer and coder there. Cool. So how long have you run Sickhead Games? Oh, it's been like 13, 14 years now, something like that. You know, uh, we went indie before being indie was a thing a long, long time ago, and we kind of uh, just worked our way from job to job and project to project over the last 14 years, and we're currently doing a bunch of ports for indie titles to... Uh, to uh, different console platforms like PS4, Xbox One, Vita, things like that. Okay, uh, well, before we talk more about that, how did you become a developer? Oh, uh, how did I become a developer? That's a deep one. Uh, I don't know. I've just had a fascination with video games since I've been a small kid, you know, from my father lifting me up off the ground to hover me over, uh, you know, an old uh, Space Invaders game so I could play it to, uh, you know, home consoles when, you know, there were the... Uh, Magnavox Odyssey and, you know, the, when the first Atari came out and things like that, um, all the way through, you know, PCs. And my father was always techie and he liked getting the newest stuff. So we had a big, a big TRS-80, you know, that, you know, you could get a lot of games on. And, you know, so ever since I've been like always, always had games on my life from day one. And uh, as soon as I had a, uh, a computer of my own, it was like, okay, how can I make my own? You know, so it's been a, a, con a constant, I guess. Uh, so I've been doing it for a very, very long time. Wow. <laughs> Professionally less, but, you know, uh, as a hobby for a very long time. Well, you've been playing games so long. Do you have a favorite Pac-Man game? Oh, favorite Pac-Man game? <laughs> I mean, I'm going to say it for nostalgia, but I guess Casey Munchkin on the Odyssey 2. <laughs> That's a, <laughs> and a very few people know what it is, but it was kind of like a Pac-Man -Pac clone ripoff. But it was a lot, lot better. In fact, you compare it to, like, the Atari's Pac-Man, it's like, this thing's a million times better. So, of course, that in lawsuits ensued, and they had to stop selling it, but I had a copy, so it was fine. <laughs> Dang. Yeah, the Atari 2600 port of Pac-Man was famously terrible. <laughs> so we first met you when Sickhead Games released a game called Armed on mm -hmm. Windows Phone, and you eventually brought that to a lot of other platforms. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a quick little summary of how Armed came to be? Uh, you know, it was an internal project that, uh, you know, one of the other guys in the studio had a concept uh, that he, he liked these strategy games, and he's like, hey, here's a concept, here's a prototype of it, and it just evolved from there. Uh, we targeted, we really targeted Windows Phone mostly because it was new, you know, it was like a new platform coming out, and there was a good chance that, hey, if it does well, we'll be on the cutting edge. If it doesn't, you know, you can port to other platforms. Uh, so that's kind of how it sort of developed from there. Uh, then we got it to Windows 10, and we started working on an iOS port, and by that time, you know, the sales of the game weren't doing tremendously well, so we kind of backed off a little bit. But, uh, you know, looking back, if we would have pushed through, maybe we would have done better, but at the same time, at the time, we weren't doing, we weren't going to, it wasn't going to be like we did it correctly. Like, you really have to be, like, in hindsight, like, marketing is 90% of, you know, selling games, and you, we were just not aimed at being a marketing thing we wanted to make a good game put it out there and make and, and say hey this is great go play it it works but that's not enough you know so i think that's really what hurt us with that project and we're taking that you know into future projects that we're looking into taking that into consideration you know that marketing is so important nowadays especially for indies so that was your your last original game you've released right. yeah uh, i mean we've done some other stuff but they were all like uh, we currently have a project that we work on for a for a museum exhibit company it's a it's a project called be the astronaut it's kind of it's currently roving around a couple different museums in the united states it's like a big multi-game space simulator adventure thing uh that we built uh so it's kind of an original game i guess it's a, a, lots of original games but it's really not being sold on like app stores or anything um so we've been doing a lots of different things <laughs> What are some of the ports you've done lately that have, that have already released? Uh, the ones that were already released, I could say, you know, the first ones that we started doing, uh, Sony contacted us about try, being interested in bringing a bunch of these XNA games to their, their platform. So that's kind of like where we started to get into this. You know, so we brought Towerfall, Axiom Verge, Escape Goat, you know, was another one we did Escape Goat 2. Oh, nice. uh, that has great music. Yeah, that was a great game. I, I really like that game. Uh, we did a couple other things. We did like... Uh, Octodad to Vita, you know, we did... Uh, My daughter has that. Oh, really? <laughs> it's a fun, it's a very fun, interesting yeah. game, especially on Vita. Uh, the We're currently working on Darkest Dungeon, uh, coming to PS4 and, uh, and uh, Vita at the moment. And uh, we have a bunch of games uh, for Xbox One that are kind of lined up over the next year. And, uh, you know, we're working with uh, people that are doing Stardew Valley, 
Um, we just helped them get their Mac and Linux ports out, and we're about to uh, get into PS4, Xbox One, and Wii U even. So, Excellent. Uh, well, can you mention any of your other Xbox projects that are in progress now? Uh, I can say Axiom Verge, but there's never really nothing else I can mention. Because I, I, again, I'm, there's a bunch of them. I don't know how many of them have announced. I don't think most of them have. So I don't want to say, you know, one that's coming that I can't say. So, But there are other ones coming. So uh, you can pretty much figure that, you know, a lot of the indies that are using XNA Monogame, you know, would be interested in bringing, you know, <laughs> it would be interesting in bringing their titles to all the platforms, you know, because most of the time these indie titles want to go wide. They want to go to multiple platforms. So you'll, you're going to see a bunch of things that you expect. That'd be nice. Yeah, I think this generation we've seen a, kind of a big Sony bias from indie game mm-hmm. developers. Do you feel like that's more because the PlayStation 4 is simply sold better or is it because of Sony's superior indie outreach? I think it's a little of both, but I think the indie outreach is the start of it, right? I mean, this was, I mean, before, it was, I guess it was right as the PlayStation 4 was shipping, uh, they had contacted us. You know, we had, we had as a sm- like, we've been running the Monogame Project now for four or five years at this point, and uh, we said, you know, we want to really get on consoles, uh, you know, because we had PCs, we had mobile, and we really want to get on consoles. So we started talking to Microsoft and Sony about that. And at the time, Microsoft was deep in Xbox One stuff, and they were very excited. They liked Monogame. They liked what we were doing. They liked that we embraced, uh, you know, uh, Windows 8 and Windows Phone. Uh, but at the time, their priority was not on getting indie titles to the platform. Their priority was, let's ship this console, make sure it's not horrible, and uh, make sure the AAA games are great. Um, and lots so, of TV stuff. Yeah, lots of TV stuff for some reason. <laughs> Uh, but then uh, Sony w- it was in a different track. They kind of saw, it seems like, where their deficiencies were. The previous generation would reaching out to indies as much as Microsoft had. Um, and they had done some, but not the same way. So this time around, they were very excited about it. So when we talked to them, like, at first we didn't hear anything, but then a couple months later, they're like, hey, we really want to get this title called Towerfall, you know, off of the Ouya, which is where the t- Towerfall originally shipped on the Ouya, <laughs> if anybody remembers that. Uh, that we're going to take it from the Wii and bring it to uh, PlayStation 4, you know, what it's going to take to do it, and that's where it all started, kind of. So they've been very aggressive about that. I mean, I know that they they kind of really looked at the XNA back catalog of, like, who's been doing XNA games that are really exciting, and we're going to reach out to every one of those guys and bring them to our platform. And I think that's really what drug a bunch of these titles, like, you know, like Salt and Sanctuary, you know, th- those guys, like, bringing Towerfall over, bringing Axiom Verge over, bringing over Scapegoat's another one, and uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting two or three other ones. Skulls of the Shogun was another one. Um, just bringing these titles that had either already shipped on Xbox 360 or had, you know, uh, Bastion, another big one that was there. Um, either they've already shipped on 360 or they were about to ship something and they want to bring them to the platform, and they were very aggressive about it. And this was, like, before the PlayStation 4 shipped, they were already doing this. Um, so that's, I think, really where that's where that came from, was that uh, they were really aggressive about it. Then on top of it, it didn't hurt that also the console sales were, were greater on that side. So that didn't, that didn't hurt the thing. You know, it didn't switch over. Now, all that's changed in recent history, and then Microsoft's kind of like, okay, we've gotten past our first year of stuff. Now we're interested in doing indie stuff. And they, they've been really helpful with it, and they've been really pushing it. It's just been, you know, their first priority just wasn't it. So... Um, I think they're starting to get back into it, and you're going to see a bunch of indie titles showing up on Xbox One here soon through the ID at Xbox program. Yeah, it's not like we have a shortage of indie titles, but it is a shame when we go to a show like uh, PAX, and most of the titles there are probably PlayStation 4, and oh, maybe a third of them are for Xbox One. You know, yeah. it's, it's nicer when they come out on both, really. Yeah, I mean, it's hard for indies because, I mean, they're usually, it's one or two people working on it, if you're lucky, four or five, and... Even then, it's hard to kind of focus on a single pal- platform or multiple platforms. So it's easier to say, well, what is, what's more important to ship on? Now, most of them, Steam is their first choice. That's where they're shipping first. Sometimes they'll ship simultaneously Steam and PS4 because, you know, there's good incentives there. You know, and there's exclusivities and, you know, uh, doing the uh, the Sony's, uh, what's Sony's program? The part of their program where you get a free game every couple months or whatever uh sometimes those games get end up shipping there and there's a deal that's worked out so i mean there's some advantages sometimes to doing those kinds of deals and i know microsoft's doing the same thing now um so i think that sometimes they just make a choice like which console platform do i want to partner with do i want to do it exclusive for a certain amount of time 
Um, and I think that's why you're seeing that. And it's because those offers are being made, and they're being made all the time. Now, some of them, some Indies do not want to do that, and they're ship, trying to ship to all the platforms at once. But uh, there are a lot of them that, you know, just through convenience or timing, uh, it's just easier for them to go to one platform or the other. Um, but uh, I think that'll be changing. I mean, again, now that now that some of the indie titles that are using XNA Monogame are are looking are, are looking to get to Xbox One, and now we have Xbox One support, I think now it makes it easier. Before there was like Xbox One support was like, well, we don't know. You know, it was kind of like a we'd love to do it, but we haven't gotten interested from Microsoft yet. And that changed last year. You know, um, and which was what uh, what resulted with that. Was, what was announced at uh, GDC, I guess, this year, um, the uh, that Mono Games coming to Xbox One, and that you know titles are coming with it, but I don't think they announced any titles at that time. Other than Axiom Verge, I think it's the only one that was announced at this point. So, how does ownership or leadership of Mono Game work then? Uh, the ownership is me and Steve Williams out in Australia. We kind of own. He's the awesome. Project. Yes, uh, he. We own the project. It was handed off to us from. Uh, uh, Dean Ellis and Dominic Louis, who were uh, who were at the time, they were going to start working over at Xamarin, and they didn't want to have a conflict of interest there because uh, with the Xamarin work and that work, so they kind of handed the project off to us. Um, so we're now in charge of the project, and we've been in charge of the project now since 2014 or so. Um, and it's really it's organic, you know. We all get along pretty well. There's nobody that's kind of like the we've been lucky in that we've hadn't had anybody like. A lot of projects, it's like uh, if you have one person who's just the problem all the time, you know, and he's in charge, you, it makes it difficult. But in this, it's been very easy. Like, if we all agree, it's fine. If all of us agree except for one of us, then the one person says, okay, fine. Everybody else agrees. It's cool. You know, it's it's been very easy in that respect. And I think we just were lucky that we fell into that. Uh, it could have been also a nightmare scenario where one person is a terror and, you know, <laughs> always wants to take some take it in a weird direction. Uh, but the only, and I think the only reason that we're here this long is because it hasn't been that way, you know, because we've gotten along well. And it's, I mean, you could go and have a, uh, a huge separate talk about like just organizing open source projects and managing them. That's a whole other realm of difficulty and uh, challenges involved there. But yeah, we've been really lucky, I think. So now Mono Game is coming to Xbox one mm-hmm. well before i ask the real question is it already on xbox one or is it in progress of being it's it's in progress i mean you're, you're going to start seeing some games ship this year um the uh in early next year so at that point i guess you could say it's on it but i mean they've been showing uh, i know that the axiom verge guys have been showing uh, the game running on on xbox one at pax this last pax they showed it there and a couple other conventions so technically it's running there but it's not you know a game isn't shipped yet so it ha- well it has to be like publicly available to everyone right wouldn't that be when it's really available what do you mean like the monogame code itself for xbox one yeah like can everybody already use it right this minute if they want or no? not at the moment we're actually trying to onboard a couple of people to start using it it's never going to be publicly available because it's you know it's written for a console that has proprietary stuff so i mean i mean there's the, the xbox one has a two stories right so they have the the UWP story, which is their universal app story, which there are games that are using Monogame that are targeting universal apps and are shipping on Xbox One and on Windows 10. Um, one of the games is called uh, Raining Blobs. It's kind of like a multiplayer puzzle game thing. Uh, but they're currently showing, they just put up a video the other day of their, their game running on, through Monogame on Xbox One using uh, UWP, um, which is perfect for, I mean, it totally can work for a lot of indie titles. Um, the limitations there are really like you don't get as much of the GPU power, as much as the CPU power, as much of the memory on the device. But you get enough that, I mean, early on I was trying to equivocate it to like the power that you would have on a 360, and it's not quite as powerful as what you would have on a 360, but it's, it's somewhere around there. So for a lot of indie games, it can work. Um, so it just sort of depends. The and, and even though you're using UWP, you can still use all the Xbox Live features and all the other features on the console, so you're not kind of like different completely. But their games are going to be shipping, I think I've already shipped using UWP on Xbox One. Uh, then you have the native side, which is the Xbox Developer Kit side, which is the, the side that doesn't have it, it isn't UWP, it's a completely different thing, it's the low level console stuff that most of the games are written against at the moment, even though you could technically do either. Uh, it, you have full access to the all the hardware at the low level. You have access to everything basically at that level. And some indies prefer that or just want that, you know, or need it. 
Um, and that's the side that was, re that's really the part that was announced at GDC more than anything else. Um, so with that, uh, that's what we're currently working on. We're starting to onboard a couple of developers, start using it and giving us some feedback on it. Um, it'll ne that part of it will never be public because it involves a lot of proprietary APIs and you have to have uh, the Xbox XDK and everything else. So you have to like sign up through, through Microsoft with the indie program, you know, and then they'll give you access to that stuff through there. But at that point, it's, it's technically open source at that point to you, you know, but you can't publicly share any of it. So you just have to be an approved Xbox developer? Right. You know, and that, that's really no different than to uh, to get your title on PlayStation 4 or on Vita or on Wii U. You have to be an approved developer for those platforms. So it's kind of the same thing. The only difference is that Microsoft offers this UWP path where you could build and deploy something in your Xbox One today and not be an approved developer. Uh, the only time you need to be an approved developer is when you actually ship your title to the platform. That's when you talk and say, hey, here's my title. Take a look at it. You know, it's close or it's finished and I want to get to the platform and, you know, you go through the paperwork and now you're an approved developer. Here's the extra stuff that you need for Xbox Live and things like that. And you can ship when, you know, here's your account manager to help you ship and there you go. So uh, I know that, so it's interesting that they have this other path that the other consoles don't have that is maybe a little bit easier because you can work on it without having to be signed up through the program. You can basically do all your work on at home on your own PC uh, without any kind of approval from anybody, and then when you're ready, you know you can say, "Hey, I want to get on the platform and talk to them about it." That's pretty sweet. So you've obviously put a lot of time and effort into Mono Game. Does Microsoft actually contract you to make it work on Xbox One? Uh, yeah, I mean, what we've done is, and this is the same for Sony and others, is that we've, uh, you know, they've they've subsidized some of the development work in order to make it happen. With the idea that, you know, as long as they feel like there's enough of titles coming out you know, that are backing it, it works, right? Like, they, the only reason they're doing this is because there are, we've been lucky in that a lot of people loved XNA and built in really interesting and, you know, unique uh, XNA games. And they want to get their stuff to other, these other platforms. And Microsoft and Sony both see the value in that. And they're like, well, this is really interesting. We want to get these things to the platform, but we need a way to get it there. Um, at first, you know, <laughs> Microsoft's original answer to Indies was like, well, just go use Unity. And it's like these titles are not going to switch to Unity. They're, they're using Monogame and XNA because they want to be, they want to work at a programmer's level and not as a designer, or just a drag and drop editor kind of level. Uh, and because of that, that's the direction they took. But yeah, I mean, the getting, you know, bootstrapping the thing onto the, onto the platform is a pretty heavy process. On PS4 and uh and Vita and Xbox One, you know, we've had some support from Sony and Microsoft to do that. On uh, the other platforms, or on, like, on Wii U, which we're starting to just barely kind of step into, mm. that's kind of being funded by pro individual projects, you know, uh, which is another way that we kind of figure out how to, I mean, end of the day, a bunch of work has to happen for this to work, to, to happen, and uh, it, to do it, you have to have some, you know, somehow I have to pay the bills, I somehow have to eat in the process. So, well, it's great when the console manufacturer subsidizes the, the work because that means that they have, it makes it easier for us to get up and running. We don't have to find, line up three or four projects to see it, make it happen. Mm. It's also a benefit to everybody in the end because then it's like, here, it's now available for you. Um, the idea being that you don't have to find somebody to help you port the title to the platform. You can then do it yourself at that point because you can download the code, uh, get access to it, and do, do the work yourself if you want, um, which a lot of indies have done that as well. You know, uh, So... It gives it, it's been good to have their support with that. If we didn't have their support, it wouldn't have happened yet. You know, it would have been taken longer, but I'm sure it would have happened at some point. Just like Wii U is kind of happening just because other people are wanting to put the effort into getting their titles to the platform. Okay, so I understand that Axiom Verge is basically already playable on Xbox mm -hmm. One using Mono Game. So, mm -hmm. how much more work has to be done on Mono Game itself for that particular platform? Um, not that much I think I mean it's it's like with anything else it's like we we have an initial port that has the core features that are used by almost every game and there are going to be cases where it's like hey this one feature we haven't implemented because it hasn't been a priority or you know this part hasn't been tested as well as the other because all the games didn't use it and this one of the game does and we run into a problem so it's kind of an ongoing development process it's not you know, this is not a thing where we have a team of 10 engineers in the back. They're building tests and building artificial, you know, building artificial tests and, and uh, filling out the entire API. We're talking about one or two people working on it at the same time as helping port games. So it's kind of like done as 
as things are needed. It's really done in a very indie sort of way, I guess. Uh, so does it need more? It probably does have some more work. I think as you see, what we've found is that as more and more titles start using it, it gets more and more fleshed out and complete, completed. But at the same time, they're, both, they're all based on the public... Uh, version of mono games. So it's not like a complete fork of the public version of mono game. It's not like they're totally different. It's the same public version of mono game. So as mono game itself evolves, we're also making improvements and changes to the platform code for the different platforms. And also, uh, the platforms themselves change. Like um, it's not like they ship the PlayStation Four and the Xbox One; and they're done. Uh, they're constantly changing the APIs and the features on the platforms. And because of that, we're constantly having to update to the latest versions of your SDKs and make sure the model game supports it. And those kinds of things are just an ongoing process, you know, that we have with the, on those consoles. Mm-hmm. So in, in reality, they'll never be done, you know. But uh, at this point, it's good enough that we're, we're going to start inviting uh, other developers to come in and start using it to port to their platform, to port their titles to the platform. So do people still develop in XNA? Is it still a living thing? Yeah, I mean, it's still out there. I know that there's still titles that that purely develop in XNA. Some of them build in a some combination of XNA and Monogame. Mostly because of convenience. You know, for XNA it's easy because it's like, if you have the SD, you maybe installed the SDK four or five years ago and it's still there and it still works. It's not like because Microsoft stopped developing it that it got uninstalled from maybe systems on the planet. It's still there. There's still games that ship on Steam today that are that are XNA based, you know, that are pure XNA, nothing else. Um, so it still lives on in that respect. It's just like it really caught the hearts of a lot of developers. Just the combination of the power that it had and the ease of use. Um, you know, it was just maybe a little ahead of its time. Like people, if it would have held out for another year or two, it might have really snowballed. But you know, it was one of those things that. You know, it was maybe a little too early for its time before people really jumped onto the thing. Um, but yeah, it's it's still used on a daily basis. I mean, people use it all the time. And uh, with Mono Game, you know, there's some people that work through Mono Game on a daily basis on Windows just to develop their game before they get to console. There's some people that just work on XNA and then look at Mono Game when they want to get to other platforms. So it's kind of a combination of things. It kind of depends on how you wanna how you wanna work. So I noticed that Axiom Verge, the PC version, didn't it use a different solution than Mono Game to come to PC? Uh, I'm not sure what it used on PC. I think on on Mac and Linux, it was using FNA. FNA was done by Ethan Lee. He basically um, he had a real interest in Linux and Linux and Mac in particular uh, over everything else. So he took a, a version of Mono Game, he forked it off into his own project, stripped out all the mobile and uh, DirectX and everything that wasn't OpenGL and basically made a version of Monogame that runs that's strictly for Linux, Mac and PC only and uh, stripped down basically just for that um, So, and that's being used by, I think either you, uh, that Axiom Verge is using that on Linux and Mac, I don't know about PC I mean FNA is what I was thinking of anyway Okay, so. yeah, yeah, but I, I'm not sure if it's used on PC as well, I mean you see it, you see both combinations, you see either that they're using FNA on all three or you're seeing that they're using FNA on Linux and Mac, uh, but they're still using XNA on PC, you know uh, and then there's, you know, Axiom Verge uses Monogame on PlayStation 4 and Vita and Xbox One so it's like, it's it's a combination, again there, there and there's more than FNA out there, there was another project out there that was like EXNA, there was a Mono XNA, there was a bunch of other projects that were kind of like XNA replacements for different platforms. Uh, but in the end, it's basically just us and FNA that are out there that are really the big ones at the moment. To wrap up, I just wanted to get your opinions on the Xbox One S and Scorpio. You know, what do you think of those two new systems coming out in so close a time? And what, you know, how are they going to help the Xbox ecosystem, I guess? I mean, I think the S is interesting. Uh, the yes, S is interesting. I mean, we knew that was going to happen eventually. That wasn't a surprise. Like, the previous console generation did the same thing. You're going to have a slimline version or a simplified version or uh, a stripped-down version. And Sony did it, Microsoft did it, and that was going to happen. Uh, I guess the only person that didn't do it was uh, Nintendo. They didn't release anything like that. Uh, the, the, the new thing is the Scorpio and, Mark, and Sony's thing is the, hey, here's an upgraded version of this console, a hot-rotted version of this console in some respects. I don't know. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see if that's a trend. Is that going to continue into the future? Like, every couple of years, there's a new console that's not a brand new piece of hardware, but an improved piece of hardware from the previous generation. Is it going to become more like phones and tablet devices than, uh, 
than the traditional console ten year cycle. Um, it's hard to say. Uh, I think some of it's probably driven by the fact that you have all this push to VR and higher definition, you know, uh, television sets, which is, you know, I guess is a little bit different from the last console generation. You really didn't have a jump from 1080p to, you know, it was 1080p almost throughout the entire last console generation. Really, it, you know, we're in the middle of this console generation, and you know, all of a sudden, this 4K is becoming a thing. So I think that they're trying not to fall behind in that, and really, to drive 4K, you have to have you know, a much bigger hardware. So it's hard to say. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how it takes off. I think some of it will take off with 4K TVs. Um, we'll see how the... I'm not a, a huge uh, believer that VR is the future of everything. So uh, we'll see how that turns out as well. Um, I think it, it'll be interesting to see what it does. But uh, for the most part, I think that, it, you know, I think the hardcore gamer is going to pick those consoles up, mostly because... They're interested in, oh, it has more power? Great. You know, it doesn't matter if it really applies to them or not. But having more power is always what some of the hardcore really want. I think the, most of the mainstream are not going to upgrade. They're going to stick to the regular console until the Scorpio and the, the other, those hot rodded consoles come down in price. Then they're probably going to be adopted by more people. I know that, that Sony and Microsoft both are being very careful about, um, you know, making sure that people aren't building things that it's like, they're trying to make sure they don't end up with games that only work on one or the other and not on the other. They're trying to be careful about that, you know. Um, but they're, uh, they're eventually obviously going to be titles that only work on the higher-end console just because of just necessity, you know. Uh, especially if they're, I think, on the VR side, you're going to see stuff like that. Even though Microsoft hasn't talked about any VR stuff, uh, who knows when they'll finally talk about that. We'll see. I think they're going to, they're, I think it seems like Microsoft's in a wait-and-see approach. Or maybe they're working on something they haven't told anybody. We'll see. <laughs> I haven't kept up with rumors. Well, that is some great insight. Uh, Tom, I just want to say you've done a lot for the indie game development scene. You know, I really. Hope so. Yeah, so many, so many developers and so many players yeah. owe you a debt of gratitude in one way or another. And also, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us today. Yeah, no problem. It was great. Excellent, guys. Read our full story at windowscentral.com. Follow me on Twitter and Twitch. And whatever you do, don't hate. Appreciate.